Um, if you were here last week, you will know that we started a brand new study in the book of Colossians, which we'll be continuing with today. If you want to turn there to chapter one in your Bibles. Um, last week, I gave a bit of an overview and a background to this beautifully written, extremely Christ-focused epistle penned by the Apostle Paul. And following that, we covered verses 1 to 8 in chapter 1 as we looked at several marks of what it means to be a faithful church and also how a faithful church can only exist when it is made up of faithful believers who are committed and consistent in their walk with the Lord as they love and serve one another, motivated by the heavenly hope they have in Christ. And of course, none of us can truly be faithful in our Christian walk unless we're living in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And in recognition of those two characteristics of Christ that this book of Colossians is all about, his supremacy and his sufficiency. The word supremacy speaks of the preeminence of Christ, that he's above all, that he's over all, that he's Lord of all, and therefore our lives should revolve around him and be lived in submission to him. The term sufficiency speaks of God's provision through Christ in giving us every spiritual blessing we could ever hope for and everything we need to live our lives effectively as followers of Christ. And in summarizing these truths, as I said last week, we could say that because Christ is Lord of all, then he is all we need. And this morning then, as we continue in chapter 1, we'll be looking at verses 9 to 14. I know I said 9 to 12 previously and encourage you to read ahead, but I'm sure that you were so diligent to just read the verses before and after for context anyway. So you'll get six verses for the price of four this morning. And this is essentially a prayer that Paul prays for the Colossian believers following his greeting and the words of thanksgiving we looked at last week. And in Paul's prayer, we're introduced to this theme of the sufficiency of Christ which is the title of the message this morning, and along with the complementary theme of the supremacy of Christ, really dominates the book of Colossians. So I'll just read verses 9 to 14, and we'll pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today through his word. So Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, we come before your word now as your people, and we're in dependence upon your spirit to give us understanding, to help us live according to your word. But Lord, may we have willing hearts to hear and receive and be transformed and changed by your powerful word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as mentioned in the introduction last week, um, the primary purpose that Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians around AD 60 to 63 from his prison cell in Rome was to address a growing heresy that was a threat to these predominantly Gentile Christians. Basically, it was an early form of Gnosticism, which is a worldview that sought to explain everything on the assumption that matter was essentially evil and that God could only touch evil matter by means of a series of eons or emanations so far removed from him as to prevent contamination. They would say, yes, you have Christ, but we can show you something more than Christ. We have access to a deeper knowledge of the ways of God. And the word Gnostic is from the word Gnosis, which means knowledge in Greek. And in particular, there were false teachings about the person of Christ, with some teaching that Jesus did not have a real human body, because matter is evil, but a phantom body, and therefore no real humanity. Others admitted the humanity of the man Jesus, but claimed that Christ was just an eon that came on Jesus and his baptism in the form of a dove and left him when he died on the cross, essentially denying his deity. So Paul goes to great lengths to counter this unbiblical thinking, and we'll see this throughout the book, 
a thinking that un undermined the person and work of Christ as it crept into the Colossian church, and by hammering home these critical and deeply encouraging truths about the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, Paul's aim is to change this thinking and to protect them from this real threat. As followers of Christ, we need to know how to counter this kind of unbiblical thinking in our days. It is still very much present. And we can only do this with solid biblical reasoning and with a consistent, faithful testimony of authentic Christianity. This helps to ensure that God is not misrepresented and that we are not led astray from the truth of God's word. So Paul gives his greeting in verses 1 and 2 on behalf of Timothy, who was with him. In verses 3 to 8 that we looked at last week, he expresses his thanksgiving for the faithfulness and fruitfulness of the church in Colossae. And as we come to verses 9 to 14, Paul then prays for the Colossian believers. And there's just so much in this prayer that we can glean from, particularly in regard to this idea of the sufficiency of Christ. So let's read from verse 9. For this reason, we also. So here Paul is linking to what he'd said in the previous verse where he praised the Colossian believers for their faithfulness and fruitfulness manifested in their love for one another. He says, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. From the very moment Paul received this wonderful news of how the Colossian believers were living out their faith, his heart was regularly lifted up in thankfulness and prayer for their spiritual progress. Now you'd think this might be a reason to stop praying for them, hearing that they were doing so well. But Paul saw spiritual progress and advancement in believers' lives as a reason to commit them to prayer more, not less. After all, he knew more than most that it's only when believers start to make progress in their walk with the Lord, bearing fruit for Christ, that they'll often experience a greater degree of conflict, a greater degree of opposition and circumstances that could discourage them than if they were to be just half-hearted in their walk with the Lord. So Paul is diligent to keep the Colossian believers in prayer. And the phrase, do not cease to pray for you, refers to prayer that is regular and frequent rather than a continuous prayer without interruption. And this kind of prayer is really, as, as John MacArthur puts it, just a God consciousness rather than some formal time of prayer. It's a state in which you look at everything and interpret everything as it relates to God, conscious of God. And this results in prayers being lifted up to God from your heart. As Paul heard the news about the Colossian believers, and at any time the Colossian believers came to his mind, he th his thoughts just quickly turned to prayers on their behalf. And so our prayers as Christians must both be intentional and spontaneous because this is how we relate everything to God. This is how we filter everything in our lives with an awareness of God. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. So what specifically had Paul been praying for? the believers at Colossae. Well, that's what we see in the next few verses. And as we go through this, the great thing is, these are all things that we can firstly pray for ourselves and we can pray them for others because it's all biblical. And there we can be confident that God will answer these prayers. As Jesus said in John 14, 13 to 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus says some similar things in other parts of the Gospel of John. John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. In John 16, 23 to 24, And in that day you will ask me nothing, most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you'll receive, that your joy may be full. Now, this is contrary to the very unbiblical idea of naming it and claiming it, seeing God as some heavenly genie who will grant us all our wishes if we just attach the words in Jesus' name to our prayers. That's not what this is talking about. In fact, John gives some clarity on this in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, where he writes, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything 
according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. So you see a confidence there related to asking for something in the name of Christ, but to ask for something in the name of Christ is to ask for something in the will of Christ. And that's what's so great about this prayer of Paul's here in Colossians and so many other prayers we find in the New Testament. Because they are biblical, because they're in line with the will of God, we can pray them for ourselves and for others and be confident that God desires to answer these kind of prayers. And how easy it is to underestimate the importance of, the blessing of praying for one another in the body of Christ. Praying for ourselves. When we look at the New Testament, we see constant references of prayers made on behalf of other believers and for other believers, because that's how God expects us to operate as believers, as we look to him and depend upon him in all things. I really encourage you to pray for one another. Don't think it's just the pastor's job to pray for the church. We're to pray for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, even as we ask for things in prayer that are in line with the will of God, it's important for us to understand that we can still resist the means by which God chooses to answer these prayers. So even if we pray in the name of Christ, according to the will of God, it doesn't mean that any prayer pray there is automatically going to be answered. For example, you may pray for patience. And God is willing to answer, and it's his will to answer, it's his will to give you patience, it's according to his name. But when he answers, you resist the means and the method by which he chooses to teach you patience. Perhaps through that irritating or annoying person you hoped God would remove from your life with that prayer. Or you may pray for guidance in a certain situation you are facing, but you don't actually open and read your Bible. That would be another way in which you wouldn't see the answer to your prayer because you've rejected the means by which God has chosen to answer it. Dear Lord, help me to do better in my devotions. And you think, I, the Bible doesn't make its way up to my bed in the morning and I open the right page. God's not answering my prayer. So our prayers must be brought to God with a willing heart to have God's will done in God's way. Then we're more likely to see our prayers answered and through the means by which God will answer those prayers. So let's continue on then and look at the things that Paul prays in the next part of verse 9. He says, And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul is not referring here to some inner voice or special revelation, but rather that the believers in Colossae might grow and deepen in their knowledge of God's will. Where do we get our knowledge of God's will? From God's word. So it wouldn't make sense again for me to ask the Lord to fill me with the knowledge of his will if I wasn't prepared to be diligent in reading, understanding and applying his word because that's where his will is revealed. The word used for filled here in the original carries the meaning of being completely filled to overflowing or in a way that you just can't get any more in. It also carries the idea of being dominated or controlled by that which has filled you because there's no room for anything else to counter that influence. Like a person filled with sorrow, they're overcome, completely dominated and controlled by their sorrow. And so here, it speaks of a person so full of the knowledge of God that it dominates and directs all of their actions. It's not the amount of knowledge, it's the degree to which the knowledge they have dominates their actions. And we see what this looks like in the following verses. And this is what Paul is praying for the believers here. Not that they can only be any good if they have some exhaustive knowledge that's going to take 15 years to obtain, but rather as they continue to grow in the knowledge of God, that knowledge they are growing in would so dominate and control their thinking, their actions and their very lives that God's will will be accomplished in and through them. This is in contrast to a person who has a certain amount of knowledge of God's will and God's ways and God's instruction for their lives, but they don't allow that knowledge to be a controlling influence in their lives. A bit like when we say you should have acted this way because you know better than that. As Christians, we know better, and so God has called us to live according to that knowledge with the strength he provides. The Bible doesn't recognize knowledge as something separate from action. True biblical knowledge is information that leads or results in 
transformation. It is knowledge that leads to obedience. And in context, of course, this was so different to the puffed up knowledge that the false teachers were claiming to have and impart, which was not from Christ. So what is the benefit then of growing in and being controlled by the knowledge of God's word and God's will? Listen to what Paul says next. He says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. There is no true wisdom, there is no spiritual understanding that can be gained in this world apart from the knowledge of God's will that we have been given in his word. No extra wisdom, no extra knowledge that can be gained apart from the knowledge of God's will that we've been given in his word. And God's word also gives us the wisdom we need to correctly understand and interpret his word. This is important because if we don't correctly understand and interpret it, it can cause us to unwisely interpret or apply it. And as Paul says here, as we grow in our knowledge of God's will, this is what helps us to be wise, to make wise choices, to make wise decisions, to have a spiritual outlook on life, which is therefore a biblical outlook. And we also have so much help in this area from the Holy Spirit, who dwells in us as believers. And that's why when it comes to correctly understanding God's will, it's not all about having a great intellect or degrees or diplomas. It's about having a spiritual understanding, which comes through a knowledge of God's will that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14, Paul wrote the following. He said, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And we also read about how a knowledge of the word helps us to know and understand God's will, <coughs> excuse me, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's word, changing your thinking, changing your conduct, that you may prove, which means to recognize or discern, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The knowledge of God's will resulting in spiritual understanding, in wisdom. And Peter also speaks of similar things as he writes the following in 2 Peter 2, 2 to 4. <clears throat> he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, power. We like to talk about power through where? Knowledge. Of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, if we were praying these things, even that we've looked at so far, for ourselves, for others, we'd be asking the Lord to fill us with the knowledge of his will as we read and study his word so that we are controlled by that knowledge, so that it would influence our thoughts, our words, our actions, our decisions, that we would have wisdom as we seek to interpret God's will and a spiritual understanding granted by the Holy Spirit in regard to what God has said in his word and how it applies to our lives. A question then, do you think God wants to answer that prayer in your life, in my life and the lives of others that we could pray for? Absolutely. Of course he does. That we'd be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And guess what? Christ is sufficient for these things. In fact, this is how we benefit from the sufficiency of Christ. That's, that's, that's how it works. We all need to grow in wisdom and spiritual understanding and Christ has made himself available to us. How? Through his word and his spirit. His word and his spirit are what make in practical terms Christ sufficient for the needs you and I have as Christians. Not apart from, but through 
the word, through his spirit, through prayer. Children, the first point for you this morning on your sheets is this. As we learn about God's will for our lives from God's word, this helps us to make wise decisions and to have a right perspective on life. You see, kids, there's all sorts of opinions out there about how to live life well, how to make good decisions. Your Bible is what will show you the most how to make the best decisions in life and what life is all about, your Bible. Let's continue on in verse 10 where we see the purpose of being filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul says, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. In the book of Ephesians, which has so many similarities in content to the book of Colossians, Paul said the following in chapter 4, verse 1. He said, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. In the book of Philippians, also written around the same period as Colossians and Ephesians, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then also in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 12, He says that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So this idea of walking worthy was an exhortation Paul gave on a number of times. His joy was greatly increased as others drew closer to Christ. And not only was Paul passionate for believers to walk in a manner that brought glory and honor to God, ultimately God himself, as he writes through Paul, desires that we as his children walk worthy of that name by which we are called, Christians. And you can see how this all links together because it's just impossible for a Christian to walk worthy of the Lord without first being filled with and allowing himself to be influenced by and controlled by the knowledge of God's will which gives him the wisdom and spiritual understanding to walk worthy of the Lord. So what does it look like to work worthy? worthy? Well, thankfully, the next lines of Paul's prayer is... He answers that for us. So Paul's prayer for the Colossians was that they may walk worthy of the Lord. And next he says, fully pleasing him. And that's certainly something of what it means to walk worthy of the Lord, to please God. And what this means here is to please God in all respects, to please God fully, to please God in everything, not to compartmentalize our relationship with him, shutting him out of certain areas of our lives. And of course, when we talk about pleasing God, it's not to be confused with trying to appease God by our own works, thinking incorrectly that God's favor is only granted according to what we do. In fact, as we look at these definitions of what it means to walk worthy of the Lord, we see in sequence here, we see that we must keep in mind these things are a result of being filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual strength and understanding rather than things we have to do in our own strength. This is what happens when we're filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul is emphasizing how they can live rather than how they should live. But to say it more accurately, you could say he is emphasizing how they should live because in Christ this is how they can live. So what does it mean to live in a way that we fully please God? Well, listen to what it says in Hebrews 11.6, where it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Aren't you glad it doesn't say without reading your Bible for an hour a day, without never missing church in your whole life, Without sharing the gospel four hours a day, it says without faith it's impossible to please him. This reminds us that pleasing God is a matter of faith first, which results in works, not the other way around. And as we saw last week, it begins with faithfulness, the sad part, trusting in God by faith, and we leave it up to God to grant the fruitfulness. <clears throat> so Paul's flow of thought here makes sense, as he says, fully pleasing him, being fruitful. Fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. 
And this is the first of several characteristics we see here of a believer who's filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, living in a way that is pleasing God. Firstly, we see the result of spiritual fruit in a believer's life. A fruitful life of good works that are rooted in faith and trust in God rather than trust in ourselves. And as I said last week, remember we are called to bear fruit, not produce it. That is God's job as we abide in him through his word and as we obey him in reliance upon the Spirit. I don't think that can be put any better than the way Jesus says it in John 15, 4-5, where he says, Abide in me, remain, continue in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Abiding in Christ is the beginning of fruitfulness, and as we step out by faith and obedience to Christ, he makes us fruitful. Many times believers will say something which, by their words, they're really saying, I'm not fruitful, to which I would respond in maybe different words, but get to the same point, are you abiding in Christ? Well, no. Well, then you shouldn't expect to be fruitful. The next characteristic Paul mentions here that is so important in regard to how we continue to walk worthy of the Lord is where he says, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Paul has prayed for the believers to be filled and influenced with the knowledge of God's will, but here he is praying for them to increase in the knowledge of God or to be growing in their knowledge of God's person. Theology proper, as it's known as, refers to the study of God, his attributes, his works. We cannot walk worthy of the Lord unless we have an increasing knowledge of who God is. We need a big God theology, not a little God theology. We need to be rich in our understanding of who God is, not poor. We need to have a depth of our knowledge of God's character, not a shallowness. None of those things will lead to fruitfulness if it's shallow if it's poor, if it's little. So how can the Lord answer this prayer for our lives and in the lives of others? As we study his word, and in particular God's character, his works, his attributes. And to do this, when we are moved to do this as believers, we intentionally seek to study God. That is a sign of spiritual fruit. But it's also a means of spiritual fruit in our lives as it loops back around. Knowledge, Fruitfulness, knowledge, fruitfulness. A devotion to knowing and understanding doctrine, not just from an academic or intellectual perspective, but out of a desire to know God and have our lives transformed by him, will inevitably lead to the next characteristic that Paul mentions, where he says in verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. This speaks of being empowered in Christ. Another characteristic of being filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul speaks in much detail about spiritual warfare, he opens that section giving us the key to gaining the spiritual strength we need to fight the spiritual battle. He says in Ephesians 6, 10 and 11, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And as he continues talking about the armour of God, it becomes clear that this relates to different aspects of the word of God in our lives as we seek to know it, trust it, understand it, memorise it, use it, apply it and proclaim it. Man, I've heard some wacky interpretations of this verse. Spiritual power is I get up in the morning and I affirm the armour of God. I will affirm the armour of God and I'll be protected. It doesn't do anything, but I won't read my Bible but I'll affirm the armour of God, it's on me. It doesn't do anything. Read the Bible, trust the Bible, understand the Bible, memorise the Bible, know the Bible, apply the Bible, proclaim the Bible. Then you'll be strong spiritually. That's what the armour of God means. Paul was sitting next to a soldier looking at the armour. We need to be protected. How can we pr be protected? By the word. But I'll communicate it in a poetic way because I'm sitting next to this guard. 24-7. That's where our spiritual strength comes from. The spirit-inspired, spirit-illuminated word of God that we can walk in by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And there's so many misunderstandings about power these days, such a lust for power. But godly power is not always demonstrated or displayed in dramatic and obvious ways. It's more of a quiet power that enables us to live in victory over sin and have an attitude and manner similar to that of Christ himself. I believe it takes a lot of power to humble and deny yourself in the middle of that heated argument that you're having with your wife and repent and say from the heart that you're truly sorry. That takes power. I believe it takes power to resist the temptation to speak your mind when somebody irritates you or frustrates you. That takes power. I believe it takes power to live even for one hour looking out only for the interests of others, esteeming them better than yourself. But we don't see that as power. We see that as small things and power is what happened up on a stage somewhere with dry ice or something. But that's not true spiritual power. And it should go unnoticed to a certain degree because it's God that gets the glory. And we, we don't see how God's power is at work. So we just think, oh, that's just how they are. That's just how you are. How do you know that person is not just desperately relying upon the power of God? We misunderstand what it means to have powerful lives for God. And we often desire it for more self-focused reasons than God-focused ones. Spiritual fruit and progress in our lives is only going to be genuine and lasting if it's a result of faith and trust in God's ability, not our own. Let's hear what Jeremiah says, 9, 23 to 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Knowledge. That I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. So Paul prays that God would fill the Colossian believers with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that they may walk worthy of him, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of him, being strengthened with all might. How? According to his power, which speaks of his sufficiency. Next, Paul mentions a kind of two-in-one or two-fold characteristic that will always be required when a believer actually begins to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, is fruitful in the works of the Lord, is strong in the power of the Lord, he says, for all patience and long-suffering. And then he mentions one last characteristic as he concludes that sentence, with joy. Again, you can guarantee when a Christian starts to get serious about their walk with the Lord, when they are done with just playing church, done with compromising, done with just going through the motions, when they start to get on track again, they become a real threat to the enemy. And when that happens, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be trials, there's going to be opposition and conflict that will test their patience, hinder their endurance, and potentially rob them of their joy, if they allow it to. So these are good things to pray from a proactive perspective. The word patience there means steadfastness, constancy, endurance, it is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. How easy it is for us to be swerved from our deliberate purpose. So we need that kind of patience if we have a heart to walk worthy of the Lord. The word translated as long-suffering is very similar to the word patience, but it also specifically relates to be slow in avenging wrongs as one bears trouble and difficulty in their life. One of the hard things about facing conflict and even the mild forms of persecution we may get even in our country as we make a stand for Christ is to have a merciful and forgiving attitude towards those who are seeking to harm or hurt us. I heard such a beautiful quote um, of a guy, I think, who was around during the time of the Reformation who was greatly accused, greatly persecuted, greatly slandered for his stand in Christ. But the quote from his enemies was, it appears he has a happiness that is beyond the reach of our accusations. Isn't that awesome? What a way to live. And that your enemies actually feel that. There is no place for us to react in sinful anger, harshness or unkindness towards those who mock and ridicule us for our faith. That doesn't mean that there's not a place to speak up or speak firmly 
in defense of others or in response to wicked and evil acts. It, it doesn't mean that it's wrong for a Christian husband or father to say to somebody, excuse me, you need to curb your language in a situation or you shouldn't treat a woman like that. It doesn't mean we're namby paying saying, oh, just pray for them. We need to speak truth, but we're not personally retaliating to those who come against us for our faith. And the thing that helps us to not retaliate is when we remember that apart from Christ, that could be us. Lastly, in this sentence then, when we think here of this characteristic of joy, we mustn't confuse this with just happiness because it's deeper than that. You cannot really be happy during a trial or in the midst of a difficult and challenging situation, but you can have joy. Why? Because it's God's joy. And it's not based upon external factors as happiness often is. That's why James said in James chapter 1, my brethren, verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. We would sometimes think, well, hang on, shouldn't it read, count it joy when you get out of that trial? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There's that word again. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And it's interesting to note here that James says we can have joy even in trials. And one of the reasons that trials help is, sorry, that trials help to produce patience. And the word patience is the same as the word we just saw in Colossians chapter 1. So be careful when you pray for patience. <laughs> but don't avoid praying for patience. That's the wrong response. Just be aware that God may use a difficult situation to form that patience in you. And then have your eyes wide open. Lord, I do need patience. Please give me patience. And then you expect that, well, how am I really going to see that work in my life? And this is a situation in which I need to learn how to be patient. Sometimes we think that you can have joy in your life or you can serve God wholeheartedly. And that would just be difficult and burdensome. But the paradoxical truth to this, however, is that it is only as we get serious in our walk with the Lord and as we dedicate ourselves to knowing God through his word that we can experience true joy. Think about it. Who was the most seriously committed and dedicated person towards the things of God who has ever walked this planet? It's not a difficult answer. Jesus, right? We agree? Who is the person who suffered the most agony than anyone who has ever walked on this planet? Not in his physical sufferings alone, as many people were crucified, but no one has experienced what Christ experienced at the cross as his Father poured out all of his wrath upon him for our sins. Jesus, again. But who could we say confidently was the most joyful person that ever walked to this planet? Jesus. The joy of the Lord is always available because it's God's joy. And so if we were praying these things for ourselves or for others, we would be asking the Lord to help us walk in a worthy manner to please him by faith, to bear fruit that glorifies his name. We would ask the Lord to help us grow in our knowledge and understanding of who he is and all he has done. And we'd ask for his strength and patience and endurance and a joy that is not based upon circumstances, but upon the grace, mercy and provision of Christ. A question do you think God wants to answer that prayer in your life and my life and in the lives of others we pray for? Absolutely. Not only that, he can and he will because Christ is sufficient for these things and has granted us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Children, here's the second point for you this morning. God will help us to live our lives in a way that pleases him if we ask for his help and if we genuinely want to know him and obey him. Again, kids, remember, it's not like superpower. Dear Lord, help me to be a wonderful Christian. And then you suddenly, it happens automatically. If you're genuine children, you ask God to help you live in a way that pleases him. He'll give you his help. Paul then continues by saying, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And this mention of giving thanks could be related to what Paul is saying himself that he's giving thanks or that he's praying this is really another characteristic of what it means to fully please God and walk worthy, that they would be thankful. Either way, it indicates the confidence Paul had in his God to answer this prayer because it's all about him. It's all about him qualifying us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. In other words, if we were asking this for ourselves, according to our own men, uh, merits and for our own benefit, we'd have no chance of this prayer being answered. But Paul reminds the believers here we've been qualified by God himself. 
That's all that matters, isn't it? In this life, that God qualifies you, that God accepts you. We've been made partakers of a heavenly inheritance and we're now part of the kingdom of light. Paul spoke of this heavenly inheritance in the opening of his letter to the Ephesians. I've mentioned this verse a few times already. Ephesians 1.3 where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has past tense blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We don't read this verse as, oh, this is awesome, what's going to happen? What can we get if we pray? This is what God has given you in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. God has prepared blessings for us in heaven. God has made blessings available to us now during our time here on earth. As we read verses 13 and 14, Paul concludes his prayer, reflecting upon and turning the Colossians' mind towards, surprise, surprise, the sufficiency of Christ. The very truth that makes this prayer answerable. Verse 13, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And this wording, quite dramatic, it speaks of a glorious transaction from the kingdom and power of darkness as we were rescued and plucked out of that by Christ's redemptive work and then transferred by Christ into the kingdom of his love or the kingdom of light as it says there. In verse 14 it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Why is this an encouragement at the end of the prayer? Well, there's only one thing that can prevent us from experiencing the life that Paul describes and prays for in these verses. There's only one thing that's preventing you or I from experiencing what it is to be filled with the knowledge of God and the fruit that follows. What's that one thing? Sin. Sin. But we can be encouraged, as it says in verse 14 here, that this one obstacle has been completely removed by Christ. So there are no obstacles. We've been redeemed, we've been forgiven, so we can live in a way that pleases Christ. So I hope as we reflect on these verses that it's a good reminder to us of this glorious truth of the sufficiency of Christ. I hope we've been able to see in a very practical way how the way in which we and others partake of Christ's sufficiency is through the means of prayer, the means of God's word, the means of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Don't look for any other answers. So apart from praying this prayer for ourselves, which we can do and will certainly benefit from, perhaps we could have a think about one or two other people in your life that you could pray for specifically using the format and content of this prayer of Paul's. I've prayed this prayer many times for for many people over the years, ever since a sermon I heard over 20 years ago, where I heard a teaching on this and it was like, oh, here's a prayer you could pray for people doesn't mean you have to tell them that you're praying for them. In fact, the challenge at the time, which, which I took up and was actually a real blessing, was to pray this prayer for a specific person. And I think they said for like six months or it was a long period of time. But the challenge was, but never tell them that you have. And you'll be constantly tempted when they s- sort of talk about things or if they say something that's good to go in their life and, and to say, oh, well, I, you know, I, I have been praying for you for six months every day just you know just between me and the lord and wow really wow but that's a real test of humility to do something like that and just keep it between yourself and god it's good to have secrets with god you know it's good good to do that so all the work is done for you and of course you need to be sincere this is not some prayer of jabez type just say the prayer put it on a card it's not got power in the prayer it's the content of the prayer it's the truth that it represents And so it's simply a case of saying something like, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and I ask that for, insert name, you would fill them with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that they might walk worthy of you, fully pleasing you, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of you. Lord, please strengthen them with all might according to your glorious power for patience and long-suffering with joy. And I give you thanks as my Father and the one who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Amen. See, that's, that's what you can do. What a great prayer for parents to pray for their children. 
You may change the wording or the format. It's not a problem. Again, it's the content. But we all need prayer. We all need to be praying for one another. And children, here's your final point this morning. Along the same lines, this prayer in Colossians is a prayer we can pray confidently for ourselves and for others because it's in line with God's will and God's word. Children, you could pray this for your parents or for a brother or sister. But don't tell them. It doesn't mean that you can't tell someone. Sometimes it's actually a good thing to tell someone you've been praying for them. And remember in this, this doesn't mean it will always be answered. We must respond to that which God makes available. But he's ready and willing to answer this prayer in our lives and in the lives of others for his glory. So to summarize all we've looked at this morning, and I haven't really had points as we've gone through. It hasn't really seemed to to fit to do that, and I want us to just see the text in in the most understandable way we can. But I will summarize it with this statement, and there's a few fill in the blanks just on the outline if you have that, and that is this. If we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, we will have wisdom and spiritual understanding, which will enable us through his power to live a life that is worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him. I just say that again. If we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, remember that means to be controlled by, influenced by, we'll have wisdom and spiritual understanding which will enable us through his power to live a life that is worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him. Next week, as we look at verses 15 to 18, we're introduced to the theme of the supremacy of Christ. I encourage you to read ahead, maybe a few verses after in case I change my mind. Okay, we'll we'll pray, and then Alvin's going to come up and lead us in communion. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this prayer of Paul's, which is so very relevant to our lives today, that we can pray for ourselves and others. And thank you for the reminder, Lord, that In all these things we've looked at, we've just shown over and over again that you have done everything that needed to be done. You've made everything available that we need to live a life that pleases you. But Father, we need your grace to pick ourselves up at times and to be diligent, to be disciplined, to get ourselves to that place where you give us wisdom and spiritual understanding, to to bring ourselves before your word. And we ask for your grace to do that. I pray for any of us, Lord, who have drifted from being consistent in your word, that we will be reminded this morning that there is no other way, there is no other wisdom, no other knowledge that will help us. And there should be no surprise while we are struggling. And for those of us who are consistent, Lord, in in the word and seeking to live a life that pleases you, but we are incredibly challenged with the trial or conflict or opposition that we will be reminded that this is what it means to live godly in Christ Jesus and that you would grant us the patience and endurance to still have joy and represent you faithfully. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.